Before I begin, I'd like to give a shout out to the Shawnigan Lake Museum and the Cobble Hill Historical Society and the two ladies who have contributed so much to the local history of Shawnigan Lake and Cobble Hill, Lori Trelaw and Brenda Krug. My name is John Orr and I'm one of those dreaded Easterners from Ontario by way of Nova Scotia. The reason that I'm here today is because of my wife, Sherry, who is a descendant of the Elford family who logged and farmed in this area. Sherry's great uncle, Ernest Elford, died in the First World War, and I was interested to know whether his name was inscribed on the South Cowichan Cenotaph. As it turns out, his name is not there, presumably because he was raised in, in Victoria. However, Ernest had a strong connection with Shawnigan Lake through his older brothers, Frank and Ray Alford, who were intimately involved with the development of this community and the local Farmers Institute. During a visit to the Shawnigan Lake Museum one day in 2014, I made a rash promise to Laurie Trelaw to research the names on the Cenotaph and deposit the results with the Historical Society. Well, what began as a simple project has developed into a fairly complex undertaking. My talk is about the South Cowichan Cenotaph and the 27 fallen of the First World War who are recorded there. The talk will take about 45 minutes and I will discuss each of the individuals in the sequence in which they died. I'd like to stress that this is very much a work in progress and I would encourage you to let me, Laurie or Brenda know where I have made mistakes or more hopefully what additional information you can provide, especially photographs. As is the case in most historical research, I am deeply indebted to those that have been this way before. The Cowichan Valley Museum and Archives in Duncan holds a great deal of relevant information, especially the collection The Men of the Cowichan Valley in World War I, compiled by the Reverend Jim Short, largely from obituaries in the Cowichan Leader. Mr. Tom Patterson has also done a great deal of work in this area. There are several others who have helped along the way, especially Dr. Juliet McMaster, who helped with the Hook family uh, information, and Dr. Linda Quinney for her assistance regarding Dorothy Twist. And of course, Library and Archives Canada provided most of the primary source material consisting of attestation papers and service records. Before I begin, I should address the why bother question. The First World War was a cataclysmic event which affected the balance of the history of the 20th century and certainly in the Middle East we are dealing with its aftermath to this day. Whether it was the end of the Victorian and Edwardian eras or marked the true beginning of the 20th century is a matter that is still being debated. With respect to Canada, the war unquestionably marked a significant step in this country's development as a self-governing nation in charge of all aspects of its society, both internal and external. The First World War was the first conflict in which the role of the individual was recorded in detail by the vast bureaucracy of an industrialized state, and these records are now in the public domain. Compare this to the situation to the previous world wars, such as the Seven Years' War or the Napoleonic campaigns, where, by and large, the record of the individual soldier or sailor was obscure. Furthermore, through the internet, the records of these individuals, that is, these individuals involved in the First World War, are available online, thereby easing the researcher's task. And an amazing amount of contemporaneous material, such as diaries and published accounts, are also available. Finally, and most importantly, the records of these individuals shine a light on the communities in which they lived. As such, it is an important aspect of local history and gives us an idea of what life was like here before and during the First World War. Just one further word. This is the record of the fallen. 
It would be intriguing to examine the record, the history of those who survived the First World War, but unfortunately, there is not as much detail to cover their story. And so we will limit our discussion to those whose names appear on the Cenotaph. I'm sure that some of us have driven past the Cenotaph and Memorial Park without a second thought, except for Remembrance Day, of course. This Cenotaph, like so many across Canada, was built by local subscription with a major effort being undertaken by the Ancient Order of Foresters, Court Shonigan. This was a philanthropic organization that has since closed down. It was the foresters who decided what style the memorial should be and, most importantly, whose names should be inscribed on the cenotaph. I'll have a few words about this later. Although three sites were originally considered as locations for the memorial, Cobble Hill was ultimately selected as, at the time, it was considered to be the centre of the South Cowichan community. The cenotaph is located in Memorial Park in Cobble Hill on grounds that were once owned by the Ancient Order of Foresters. The Vancouver firm of Peterson, Chandler and Stevens was engaged to design and erect the cenotaph and work began late in 1919 and it was completed in early 1920. It is in an obelisk style and is mounted on a plinth. On the day of the dedication, Sunday, 15 February 1920, Premier John Oliver stood in for Lieutenant Governor Colonel the Honourable E.C. Pryor, who was ill with influenza. The Premier was received at Cobble Hill Station by an honour guard of 30 cadets from Shawnigan Lake Preparatory School and several local notables, including Mr. George Bonner, the Master of Ceremonies for the day. In addition, there was a very large group of assembled citizenry as well as 40 returned veterans. After the Second World War, the names of the fallen of that conflict were added and later the Dutch community uh, placed a marker in the area behind the cenotaph in recognition of the sacrifice of the Canadians who liberated Holland. In 2009, the cenotaph was refurbished and moved approximately five meters to its current location in the center of Memorial Park. These are the names of the fatalities of the First World War from South Cowichan. For each name, I have composed a page made up of the memorial page from the Commonwealth War Graves site, as well as an extract of personal data from the attestation papers that the individual signed on enlistment. In some circumstances, I will talk about the actual battles in which the troops were engaged, as is the case for the Battle of St. Julian in 1915, in which five men from South Cowichan were to die. The 1st Canadian Division arrived in France for duty in the trenches of the Ypres salient in April 1915. On April the 22nd, they experienced their first major engagement in what has come to be known as the Second Battle of Ypres or the Battle of St. Julian. In that day, the Germans used chlorine gas in an effort to break the stalemate along the Western Front and to smash through the salient in order to capture Calais and the Channel ports. The gas attack began at approximately 5 p.m. in front of two divisions of the French Army on the immediate left of the 1st Canadian Division. In the ensuing melee, both French divisions withdrew from their positions, thereby threatening to collapse the salient. Once the extent of the open flank of the Canadian left became apparent during the evening of April the 22nd, Major General Alderson, commander of the 1st Canadian Division, ordered an immediate counterattack. Accordingly, at midnight of April the 22nd, 23rd, the 10th and 16th Battalions put in a hasty attack on Kitchener's Wood, 
an area that overlooked the town of St. Julian. Against all odds, the two battalions swept the Germans from their position and recaptured four heavy guns that had been lost earlier in the day. In the face of the inevitable German counterattack on April the 23rd, the 10th and 16th, now mixed together, fell back to the southern edge of Kitchener's Wood. It was during the fighting of the night of 22nd, 23rd April in Kitchener's Wood that Private Thomas James Young of the 16th Battalion lost his life. The battle was so ferocious that his body was not recovered, and he is commemorated, along with the other missing, on the Menin Gate in Ypres. Young was born in the UK in 1891, and prior to coming to the Cowichan Valley, had served for eight years in the Royal Navy. On April the 24th, the Canadians faced another gas attack, this time directly in front of the trenches of the 3rd Brigade. The ensuing battle involved all available reserves, including three companies of the 7th Battalion, which were moved to the vicinity of St. Julian to stem the tide on the 3rd Brigade's left flank. It was on this day, later known as St. Julian Day, that a further three men from South Cowichan died. Private Hamilton de Beauvoir Nelson of the 7th Battalion was born in 1895 in San Francisco to British parents. He was raised and educated in the UK and he stated on, on his enlistment that his trade was rancher, a common enough designation for men of the Cowichan Valley. As in the case of Private Young, Nelson's body was not recovered and he is commemorated on the Menin Gate. Private Horace Leslie Ravenhill of the 7th Battalion was born in the UK in 1889 and prior to moving to Shawnigan Lake with his father and two aunts in 1910, served for a year in the 7th Battalion of the Cheshire Regiment. When he joined up, Ravenhill described his trade as bushwhacker, no doubt an accurate reflection of his occupation as he and his father sought to tame the wilds of Shawnigan Lake. Once again, Ravenhill's body was not recovered and he is commemorated with his mates on the Menin Gate. Lieutenant Napier Arnett Jessup of the 7th Battalion was born in the UK in 1888 and emigrated to Cobble Hill, where he first worked at Hill Farm before coming, becoming a stockbroker with the firm of Hall and Floyer in Victoria. Prior to the war, he served with the 6th Battalion, the Bedfordshire Regiment, and the 2nd County of London Yeomanry. In Canada, he joined the 88th Regiment, or the Victoria Fusiliers, and was serving with that unit on strike duty in Nanaimo from August 1913 until the outbreak of the war. When he joined up, he described his trade, rather enigmatically, as gentleman. His body was recovered after the battle, but was initially unidentified. When individual graves were consolidated after the war, his remains were identified through a locket and chain and his battalion and rank badges. He is buried in Oostaverna Cemetery, Belgium. His commanding officer is quoted as saying of Lieutenant Jessup on April the 24th that, Jessup was perfectly splendid under the fierce attack that was thrown against us that day. He was an inspiration to his men. There is not much to tell, for his platoon were in the trenches throughout and merely fought the Germans off by rifle fire. There was nothing spectacular about it, but it was the height of enduring courage. Our final South Cowichan fatality of 1915 was Corporal Arthur Emil Jones. At the time of the Second Battle of Ypres, he was serving with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry which had proceeded independently to France before the 1st Division arrived. 
The PPCLI were part of the 27th Division of the British Expeditionary Force during the Second Battle of Ypres and were located to the south of the 1st Canadian Division. Jones was born in the UK in 1890 and emigrated to Canada in 1912. He initially joined up in Victoria in November 1914 with the 30th Battalion of the second contingent of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. When he joined, he stated that his trade was clerk. As in the case of several Canadian Expeditionary Force battalions, the 30th was designated as a reserve battalion when it arrived in the UK and provided reinforcements to the understrength units in Belgium. He was transferred to the PPCLI in early April 1915 and during the battle around Ypres suffered from gas poisoning. He was evacuated to No. 11 General Hospital, Boulogne, and died there on May the 5th, 1915. He is buried in Boulogne Eastern Cemetery. At the end of 1914, the situation on the Western Front had entered a stalemate as the opposing armies of the Central Powers and those of the French and British Empires dug in along a line from Switzerland to the English Channel. In an attempt to break out of this impasse, Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, proposed that the French and British navies force the Dardanelles Strait leading to the, from the Aegean, or the Mediterranean Sea, to the Sea of Marmara, thereby removing Turkey as a belligerent power and opening a maritime passage to Russia. When the naval operation failed due to the determined defense of the strait by the Turks, it was decided to double down and land ground troops on the Gallipoli Peninsula to clear the Turks from the area. As is well known, this operation was also a failure. What may be less well known is that the Gallipoli campaign involved two young men from South Cowichan, Duncan and Robin Hooke. The Hooke family emigrated from England to Vancouver Island in 1910 and established a farm in Cobble Hill. As both Duncan and Robin Hooke were qualified civil engineers, they were soon gainfully employed in the construction of the Kettle Valley Line in the interior of British Columbia. When war was declared on August, August, the, 4th, August the 4th, 1914, Duncan and Robin promptly answered the call of duty, took the train to New York, and booked a passage, first class, to the UK. They then enrolled in an officer training corps and were subsequently commissioned as second lieutenants in the 9th Battalion Lancashire Fusiliers. The 9th was one of the first units of Kitchener's New Army, named after Lord Kitchener, Secretary of War, who had accurately forecast that the First World War would not be over quickly and would require large-scale mobilization of the populace. The initial Gallipoli landings took place at the southern end of the peninsula in April 1915 and soon became bogged down. In an attempt to turn the flank of the Turkish troops and to support a breakout operation, a landing, a landing further up the coast was planned for August 1915. The 9th Battalion was part of a landing force that came ashore in Suvla Bay during the night of August 6th-7th. The landing was botched from the very beginning due to a variety of circumstances not the least of which was that they were landed in over four and a half feet of water when they had anticipate, anticipated no more than two feet. Remember that the average height of a Tommy at this time was under five and a half feet. Once ashore, the troops became disoriented in the dark and made slow progress against a smaller Turkish force of well dug in, experienced soldiers who had been alerted when the British landing force arrived offshore. Counting on the element of surprise, the British plan had been to sweep the Turks out of their positions with cold steel, that is, the point of a bayonet, and the troops were ordered not to load their rifles before dawn. When it became apparent that the landing was actively opposed, the troops had great difficulty using their weapons as they had been immersed in salt water and the firing mechanisms had seized up. 
Sometime during the early morning of August 7, 1915, Duncan and Robin Hook both died in the assault on Hill 10, a short distance from their initial landing area. So passed two sons of South Cowichan, a very long way from home. They are interred side by side at the Hill 10 Commonwealth Wargrave Cemetery in Suvla Bay, Gallipoli. We now move on to 1916, the year that featured the disaster of the Battle of the Somme, which began on the 1st of July. But before that, the Canadians had to face further combat in the Ypres salient. Arthur Reginald Phillips joined the 67th Battalion, Western Scottish, in November 1915. His attestation papers indicate some of the hazards related to researching these men. His papers, which he signed, indicate that he was born in Chel Cheltenham, South Wales. In fact, he was born in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire. Why this error occurred, I have no idea, although I suspect a rushed procedure and a sloppy clerk. Phillips was older than most recruits and was married. His wife lived in Victoria and he gave his trade as rancher. The 67th was initially structured as an infantry battalion. On its arrival in England in April 1916, the 67th began its advanced training to take its position in the trenches on the Western Front. Phillips arrived in England on the 11th of April 1916, and shortly thereafter he contracted an infectious disease. He died on the 26th of April in the isolation hospital at Aldershot without ever getting to the front. He was the first member of the 67th Battalion to die overseas, and his death is a useful reminder that not all deaths were attributable to enemy action. He is buried in Aldershot Cemetery, and we will not be able to discover his exact circumstances of death until the service file is digitized by Library and Archives Canada. Joseph Newenham was born in Staffordshire, England in 1875. He apparently spent his youth in the United States and arrived in British Columbia around 1904. His family settled in Cobble Hill and he joined the 88th Regiment, the Victoria Fusiliers, prior to the outbreak of the war. When he joined up, he entered the 62nd Battalion and shortly after the arrival of that unit in England in April 1916, it was broken up. Newnham was transferred to the 2nd Canadian Mounted Rifles Battalion, a mounted infantry unit, infantry unit that had become an infantry battalion of the 3rd Canadian Division. Shortly after Newnham joined his unit, which was still in the Eep salient, the 3rd Division was heavily attacked on the 2nd of June in a battle known as the Battle of Mount Sorel. The Germans had mined the Canadian position and there was great loss of life. Newnham was wounded early on during the battle and was evacuated to No. 13 Stationary Hospital in Boulogne where he died of his wounds. He is buried in the Boulogne Cemetery. John Stanley White was born in Ipswich, Suffolk, England, in 1890. Prior to the war, he served with the 88th Regiment and joined the 7th Battalion as a private soldier in Valcarche at the outbreak of the war. Although he was single when he enlisted, very shortly after the battalion arrived in England, he married Mary Meredith. One can only imagine the telegrams back and forth. White served with the 7th throughout their time in the Ypres salient and on the 20th of March 1916 was promoted to temporary lieutenant. The Canadians left the Ypres salient in early August 1916 and went into the line in front of the village of Courcelet in the Somme. They experienced heavy fighting as soon as they entered the trenches and Lieutenant White was wounded shortly after the 7th arrived. He was evacuated to England 
and died of his wounds on the 24th of August, 1916. He is buried in Kensal Green, London. Jack Douglas McFarlane was born in Dublin in 1890. He was a teamster and lived with his wife in Cobble Hill. When he joined up, he enlisted in the 29th Battalion, which was based in Vancouver. The 29th made the move with the rest of the Canadian Corps to the Somme in August. On the 15th of September, the attack against Courcelette commenced, and after the vi village was captured, a meat grinder operation began as the Canadians attempted to advance further to a location that was eventually known as Regina Trench. On the 26th of September 1916, McFarland was reported as missing and presumed dead, and following the discovery of his, of his remains, he was listed as killed in action. As an aside, it was on the same day, in the same battle, but in a different battalion that my wife's great uncle, Ernest Robertson Elford, was killed. His body was not recovered and he is commemorated on the Vimy Memorial. John Fraser was born in Inverness, Scotland in 1884. When he arrived in Canada, he took up residence with his brother and sister. When he enlisted in the 67th Battalion in Victoria, he indicated that his occupation was carpenter. As related in the case of Arthur Phillips, the 67th arrived in England in mid-April 1916. At the beginning of May, the battalion was re-rolled to become a pioneer battalion of the 4th Division and continued its training until mid-August when the battalion arrived at the front. A pioneer battalion performed minor engineering tasks in the front lines, such as consolidating positions captured by the infantry, tunneling, mining, wiring, railroad work, deep dugout work, and laying out, building, and keeping the trenches in repair. In October, the 4th Canadian Division and its pioneer battalion, the 67th, were sent into the front line in relief of the rest of the Canadian Corps in front of Regina Trench, not far from Courcelette. By this time, the battlefield was a sea of mud, and it was there that John Fraser was killed in action on the 11th of October, 1916. He is buried in Adenac Cemetery. The last of the South Cowichan fatalities for 1916 was George Palmer. He was born in 1884 in Bristol, England, and emigrated to Canada sometime after 1911. Intriguingly, his trade is listed as hotel manager, although I've been unable to track down the hotel where he was employed. Palmer was a member of the 50, 50th Regiment, Gordon Highlanders, before the war, and enlisted in the 67th Battalion along with John Fraser and Arthur Phillips. As has already been explained, the 67th was engaged in the closing days of the Canadian Corps struggle at the Somme, and Palmer was killed in action by an enemy high explosive shell on the 21st of October 1916 while he was working north of Courcelet. He is also buried in Adnac Cemetery. James Kinber Doney was born in Cornwall, England in 1891. In the early years of the 20th century, his family moved to Cowichan Station. He was a member of the Cowichan Amateur Athletic Club and was a successful sprinter and basketball player. Prior to the war, he joined the 88th Regiment, the Victoria Fusiliers, and served in the British Columbia Horse at the beginning of the war when it was placed on active service for local protection duties. He eventually enlisted in the 103rd Battalion, which mobilized in Victoria, and went overseas with that unit in July 1916. Of note, he described himself as a gentleman farmer on his attestation papers. Prior to leaving Canada, Doney was promoted to acting sergeant and by November was promoted to acting company sergeant major. In January 1917, the 103rd was folded into the 16th Canadian Reserve Battalion. With the prospect of getting to the front slowly receding, Doney accepted a reduction in rank to private 
and transferred to the 54th Battalion to see action in France. He arrived at the front in February 1917 during the prelude to the Battle of Vimy Ridge. On the 1st of March 1917, he was killed in action during the attack on La Folie. His body was not recovered and he is commemorated on the Vimy Memorial. Murdo Fraser was the younger brother of John Fraser and was born in Inverness, Scotland in 1899. He was a plumber by trade and joined the 103rd Battalion on the 4th of January 1916. When the 103rd Battalion was disbanded in England, as related previously, Fraser was transferred to the 102nd Battalion in France and arrived at his new unit in a, on 17th of February 1917. On the 9th of April, the Battle of Emmy Ridge commenced. Fraser was one of more than 3,500 fatalities suffered by the Canadian Corps during the battle that lasted from the 9th to the 12th of April. He is buried at Canadian Cemetery No. 2 in Neuville-Saint-Vaast. Henry John Gardner was born in London in 1884. He came to Shawnigan Lake in 1906 and had relatives in the area. He was an avid member of the Shawnigan Lake Athletic Association and according to his attestation papers was a logger. He also joined the 103rd Battalion in December of 1915 and deployed with that unit to England in July 1916. Gardner transferred to the Canadian Machine Gun Depot in November of 1916 and after completing training was posted to the 5th Canadian Machine Gun Company on the 4th of April 1917. He suffered serious wounds on the 17th of April and subsequently died at number 13 Stationary Hospital in Boulogne, France, where he is buried. Thomas Edwin Guns was born in Cowichan Station in 1897. He was educated in Duncan and Cowichan Station and helped his father who was the manager of Pemberton Farms. He joined the 103rd Battalion in November 1915 and indicated that he was a rancher on his attestation form. In November 1916, following the arrival of the 103rd in England, Guns was transferred to the headquarters of the 2nd Division as a groom. He remained there until he left for France to join the 54th Battalion in March of 1917. He was subsequently attached to the 11th Canadian Light Trench Mortar Battery in support of the 54th Battalion and came through the Vimy Campaign unscathed. On the 15th of August 1917, while acting as a runner in the vicinity of Lens, he was shot by an enemy sniper. His body was not recovered and he is commemorated on the Vimy Memorial. Strangely enough, there were no further casualties for South Cowichan during the balance of 1917. I say strangely, since the fall of 1917 saw the horror of the Battle of Passchendaele in which more than 4,000 Canadians died. Lieutenant Alfred Edwin Hilton Lye was born in 1881 in Trenton, Ontario. He attended the Royal Military College of Canada at the turn of the 20th century and at some point moved to the Victoria area where he and his wife settled in the vicinity of Cobble Hill. On his attestation papers he indicated that he was a rancher. In November 1914, Lye joined the 2nd Canadian Modern Rifles Regiment and proceeded overseas with that unit. As already explained, the Mounted Rifles were soon to be converted to infantry battalions. Presumably, Lai wished to belong to a cavalry unit and not the infantry, so he joined the Fort Garry Horse in September 1915 in England. The Fort Garrys moved to France in February 1916 and formed part of the 1st Canadian Cavalry Brigade. On the 26th of February 1918, Lai died of wounds received in the vicinity of Peronne, France, at number 55 Casualty Clearing Station and he is buried at Tancor New British Cemetery.
Arthur Freeman was born in Culver Hill in 1897. He was drafted under the terms of the Military Service Act of 1916 and reported to the 2nd Depot Battalion of the BC Regiment in Victoria in January 1918. On his attestation papers, he indicated that his trade was truck driver. After recruit training, he was, taken to, he was sent to England where he arrived on the 19th of April and was taken on strength by the 1st Canadian Reserve Battalion. He remained there until mid-August when he was drafted to the 72nd Battalion in France. On the 8th of August, the Canadians had begun the 100 Days Campaign, which would take them from Amiens in France to Mons in Belgium in a leapfrog advance across the country. It was a bloody business, but it finally featured mobility on the battlefield and consequently a high rate of casualties. In the opening attack at Amiens on the 8th of August, the Canadians advanced nearly 13 kilometers and caused German General Ludendorff to call it the Black Day of the German Army. Freeman arrived during the advance of the 72nd from Amiens and died on the 2nd of September 1918 while serving as a Lewis gunner. He is buried in Vancouver, British Cemetery. Dorothy Pearson Twist was born in Lancashire, England in 1884. She came to Victoria in 1912 with her brother Hugh, seven years her elder, and worked as a secretary to the manager of the Imperial Bank in Victoria. Dorothy parent, Dorothy's parents followed their offspring later and settled in Shawnigan Lake. When the war broke out, Dorothy trained with the St. John Ambulance Brigade in Victoria. Then, accompanied by her brother Hugh, she returned to England and joined a British Red Cross Society Voluntary Aid Detachment in London. The VADs did the unglamorous scut work in the various military hospitals in England and on the continent. They were not particularly welcomed by the registered nurses, who in the Canadian Army held commissions, and who were fighting their own battle for recognition within the medical profession. The VADs often attracted women of independent means, usually from the upper classes, who did not have professional qualifications in their own right, but wanted to do their bit, just like their brothers. In July 1918, Dorothy was attached as a VAD nursing assistant to the Frensham Hill Military Hospital in Farnham, Surrey. At some point, she became ill and died of influenza on the 26th of September 1918. Since Dorothy was working under the auspices of the British War Office, she was buried in Aldershot Military Cemetery with full military honours. William Herbert Dan was born in Bournemouth in 1885. The Dan family emigrated to Cobble Hill in 1908 and operated a farm in the area. William's father, Herbert Dan, enlisted in the Canadian Army Medical Corps in September 1917 and served in Esquimalt, leaving William and his mother to run the farm. In January 1918, William was drafted under the terms of the Military Service Act of 1917 and reported to the 2nd Depot Battalion of the BC Regiment in Victoria in January of 1918. After recruit training, he was sent to England where he arrived on the 19th of April and was taken on strength by the 1st Canadian Reserve Battalion. He remained there until late August when he was drafted to the 7th Battalion in France. On the 27th of September 1918, uh, Herbert, uh, sorry, Dan was killed in action in operations around Bourlon Wood. He is buried at saint les marquion British Cemetery. Thomas James Thompson Jeffrey was born in Victoria in 1893. His family moved up to Cobble Hill in 1908 where they took up farming. Like Freeman and Dan, Jeffrey was drafted under the terms of the Military Service Act of 1917. Unlike those two soldiers, Jeffrey's service record 
has yet to be transcribed, but it is safe to assume that, like them, he reported to the 2nd Depot Battalion of the BC Regiment in Victoria in January 1918. On his attestation papers, he indicated that his trade was farmer. After recruit training, he was sent to England, where he arrived in mid-April and was taken on strength by the 1st Canadian Reserve Battalion. He likely remained there until mid-August when he was drafted to the 72nd Battalion in France. On the 29th of September 1918, while in the village of saint cour he was killed in action by a rifle bullet. His body was not recovered and his name appears on the Vimy Memorial. Edward Oswald Sheringham was born in Grand Forks, BC. At some point, his mother took Edward to England and they both appeared there in the 1901 and 1911 censuses. Later, Edward joined his cousin in Mill Bay and worked as a farmhand until he joined the BC Horse for local protection duties in July of 1915. Shortly afterwards, he joined the Canadian Cyclists, one of the more obscure units in the First World War. They were intended to operate as mounted, mounted infantry and were attached to each division. Sheringham went overseas with the Cyclists and eventually transferred to the Canadian Machine Gun Corps. He was serving with the 1st Battalion of the Canadian Machine Gun Corps on the 1st of August 1918 when he was shot in the chest and is buried in saint cour British Cemetery. Geoffrey Hook was the youngest brother of Duncan and Robin Hook, who died at Gallipoli in 1915. Like his brothers, he was born in Surrey and emigrated with them to Galway Hill around 1910. Jeffrey decided that he would not follow his brothers into the infantry and instead joined another unique or organization of the First World War, the Royal Flying Corps Canada. RFC Canada was established as an imperial unit operating in Canada without reference to the Canadian government, but recruiting Canadians and Americans to join the Royal Flying Corps to serve on the Western Front. RFC Canada had been set up in the aftermath of the Battle of the Somme in 1916 when it became apparent that there would need to be a vast expansion of the British flying services to handle the demands of modern warfare. RFC Canada can claim to be the precursor of the Royal Canadian Air Force and the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan of the Second World War. It can also claim to have laid the foundation for the Canadian aviation industry. Jeffrey joined as a cadet in Toronto in October 1917 and went through the cycle of training, quite possibly deploying to Texas in the winter of 1917-1918. He received his wings on the 10th of March 1918 and, as in the case of military flying schools to this day, Jeffrey was retained in Canada as an instructor and never deployed overseas. On the 11th of March, he was appointed to the RFC Canada Aerial Gunnery School at Beamsville, Ontario, to instruct in advanced aerial fighting. On the 2nd of May 1918, Hook was involved in a mid-air collision with another aircraft about 200 feet above the ground. Both instructors survived the accident, but both students died. Hook was sent home to Calva Hill to recover from his injuries and died there on the 4th of October 1918. He is buried in the churchyard of St. John the Baptist Anglican Church in Cobble Hill. James McClurg Jr. was born in Cobble Hill in 1892. While little is known of his family, when he enlisted in the 88th Battalion in December, December of 1915, he indicated that his trade was logger. Whether he went overseas with the 88th will not be known until the service record is transcribed. What is known is that he eventually died in the Royal Jubilee Hospital of pulmonary tuberculosis on the 29th of April 1919 and is buried in Ross Bay Cemetery. As previously mentioned, it's useful to remember that not all the deaths of the First World War were due to enemy action and tuberculosis in the years before the development of penicillin was a particular threat. We now have two unidentified names that appear in the South Cowichan Cenotaph, C. Newling and 
W. Perun. I have searched high and low for these men and have yet to discover anything. Of note, they do not appear on the couch in Valley Cenotaph in Duncan. These unidentified names speak volumes about the way that the lists of the fallen were put together, usually by public appeal, without the benefit of a central registry. Of note, a number of those that we have talked about today appear on more than one cenotaph in Canada or the United Kingdom. Before I conclude, I would like to draw your attention to the following slides which attempt to provide a big picture for us. This slide shows the dates of birth of those that we have discussed. As you can see on this slide, the vast majority of those who died during the First World War were born in the British Isles, and this reflects the nature of settlement in South Cowichan. This slide shows that the vast majority of volunteers came forward in the early years of the war, and that by the end, when even more reinforcements were needed, the Manning Pool was empty, thereby necessitating the enactment of the Military Service Act. While the majority enlisted in Victoria, the 1st Division uh, volunteers signed on in Valcarche in 1914. This slide is consistent with statistics for the Canadian Expeditionary Force, except for the unusually high numbers in 1915, which undoubtedly reflects the impact of the Battle of St. Julian, which was a brawl and not an organized battle. As mentioned before, the losses in 1918 reflect the fact that the Canadians had left the shelter of their trenches of the earlier years, and particularly in the Hundred Days campaign, were on the move and therefore exposed to enemy fire. Just a reminder, this is a work in progress. Any information that you have on the fallen would be greatly appreciated and be cast, passed to either Brenda or Laurie. 